Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we speak with Mary Beth Brangan of the Ecological Options Network. Mary Beth helped to organize the event Fukushima Contamination in the Ocean and in the Biosphere, which featured Drs. Timothy Mousseau and Ken Bissler talking about what their research has shown regarding radiation impact in the Pacific Ocean, in Chernobyl, and at Fukushima. Mary Beth reports on points both profound and perhaps controversial, shared by those two scientists, as she adds her own perspective, honed by over 30 years of filming the anti-nuclear movement. We also have an update on the fix of the NuclearHotSeat.com site with good news and fingers crossed that we'll have something to show you real soon. Plus, our regular numb nuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than Stephen Colbert has yet had on The Late Show. But the season is still young, and I am hopeful. All of this information is going to be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 15, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. In Japan, the nuclear story this week is water, water everywhere, and none of it is good. Tropical storm Ita came on shore on Wednesday, September 9th, bringing with it heavy rainfall on the Kantu and Tohoku region, meaning it includes the entire Fukushima area. The extensive flooding prompted the release of an unknown amount of contaminated water from the wreckage of the nuclear facility at Fukushima. Tokyo Electric Power Company, TEPCO, said that rainwater containing radioactive material flowed into the Pacific Ocean from the disabled Fukushima Daiichi power plant on Friday morning, September 11, because floodwaters overwhelmed drainage pumps. The amount of the overflow and the radioactive material that escaped was not known, but it has been estimated that hundreds of tons of radioactively contaminated water from the facility flowed into the ocean. TEPCO is claiming that the samples of water taken on Wednesday, September 9th, quote, show safe, low levels of radiation. And then they say that from the sampling on the 9th, TEPCO concluded that slightly tainted rainwater, slightly tainted, had overflowed into the sea. However, the new sampling measurement results show no impact to the ocean. I think those people need to know that you have to turn on the equipment in order to get an accurate measurement. Tropical Typhoon Ita also swept away what was originally labeled as 82 large plastic trash bags containing radioactive grass and other contaminated materials that had been collected at the site of the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. An updated report on NHK increased the number of bags believed to have been washed out to sea at 395. Do I hear 400? The bags had been stored in nearby Itate, Fukushima Prefecture. On Monday, September 14, TEPCO released 850 tons of what they deemed treated radioactive groundwater into the Pacific Ocean off the Fukushima nuclear power plant. TEPCO began discharging water after a third-party panel confirmed that the radioactive content was below the standard set by the utility. This means nothing, because what are TEPCO's quote-unquote standards? They allow one becquerel of radioactive cesium per liter of groundwater. That's a liter bottle like you carry around with you to the gym. One becquerel of radioactive cesium, but wait, it gets better. Three becquerels per liter for elements that emit beta rays, such as strontium-90, and because tritium cannot be taken out of groundwater, they admit that it's very hard to treat, they allow 1,500 becquerels of tritium per liter of water. 
TEPCO claims that the groundwater has been cleaned to permissible radioactive levels. But I didn't give permission for that. They gave permission to themselves, as did the government of Japan. Municipalities and local fishermen have expressed worry about the possible effects on the environment if something goes wrong. More than already has. So the government and TEPCO say they will conduct strict monitoring of the discharge. Even though they've already put out a statement that the radiation level of rainwater would be sufficiently below the legally permitted level. Oi. And as if that's not bad enough, on Friday, September 11, TEPCO admitted that one of the holding tanks on the premises of Fukushima had been leaking drainage rainwater into the ocean. When it comes to problems at Fukushima Daiichi, when it rains, it pours, and TEPCO just can't hold their water. As a reminder of how bad the radiation and water situation can be and has been at Fukushima Daiichi, on June 19, TEPCO announced that they had measured one million becquerels per cubic meter of strontium-90 at two separate locations at the Fukushima plant port. This is the highest reading in recorded history from a sample that was taken on May 4th of this year. Over to the U.S. this week, where the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has announced that it will terminate the study on cancer risks near nuclear facilities. Yeah, who'd want to know anything like that? An NRC spokesperson justified the cancellation due to cost and, quote, the long duration, end quote, of such a study while pointing to the agency's, quote, responsibility to use congressionally provided funds as wisely as possible, end quote. Among the many leaders in the anti-nuclear movement who have responded to this ridiculous set of claims is Paul Gunter, Director of Research Oversight at Beyond Nuclear, who said, the NRC is certainly willing to spend millions of dollars as long as it takes to license and relicense aging reactors that are likely responsible for cancers the agency now refuses to even look at. He went on to say the NRC canceled the study because, quote, neither they nor the nuclear industry want the public to know there are elevated cancer rates around nuclear power plants. Gunter pointed to a 1990 cancer study in southeast Massachusetts conducted by the State Department of Public Health that found a 400% increase in adult leukemias around the Pilgrim nuclear power plant. The increases were in direct correlation to the proximity and amount of time an individual lived near the reactor. And, of course, we interviewed Dr. Ian Fairley for Nuclear Hot Seat Number 217 on his compilation of statistics about cancer risks and leukemia risks to children living in proximity to nuclear power plants. Radiation and Public Health Project has also been circulating its letter from 2012 regarding this study as it was supposedly getting started. If you wish to respond, please write to your congressperson and let them know of this latest example of how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not, as it says in its slogan, protecting people and or the environment. Speaking of the NRC, it's time for the duck <laughs> and cover report. On Sunday, September 13, the Fermi-2 reactor in Michigan experienced a manual scram, an emergency shutdown, due to loss of turbine building closed cooling water. Other U.S. reactors currently generating zero electricity are McGuire-2 in Charlotte, North Carolina, St. Lucie-2 in Jensen Beach, Florida, Sequoia 1 near Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Byron 1 in Illinois. <laughs> During a hearing by two subcommittees of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Representative Paul Tonko, a Democrat from New York, said rising water temperatures caused by climate change could force more nuclear power plants to shut down. This past August, the Pilgrim plant in Massachusetts had to cut power by 10%, as the water the facility pulls in from Cape Cod Bay for cooling hit 75.09 degrees, the fourth time in two years that intake water exceeded the NRC's 75-degree limit. In 2014, the NRC signed off on a request from Dominion Resources Incorporated's Millstone Nuclear Plant in Connecticut 
to allow it to draw water up to 80 degrees instead of 75. That's right. If you can't fix the problem, fix the perception. NRC spokesman Neil Sheehan said in an email, The NRC doesn't have any studies or rulemaking processes underway that would look explicitly at the effect of climate change on plant operations. <coughs> New York State has begun holding hearings at the State Department of Environmental Conservation in Albany on a proposal to close the Indian Point nuclear plant for part of each summer to protect fish during spawning season. The environmental group Riverkeeper says the annual shutdowns of the plant in Buchanan each summer for 42 to 92 days, that's six weeks to about three months, would protect Hudson River fish during the early stages of life. Oh, don't stop there. Just shut it down completely. Put it out of its misery. But Entergy spokesman Jerry Mappy argues the outages would hurt air quality by forcing greater reliance on fossil fuels. And then Mappy went on to say that Indian Point is, quote, fully protective of life in the Hudson River. And that is this week's Nuclear Hot Seat Nuclear Regulatory Commission duck <coughs> and cover report. On a more serious note, hundreds of birds are washing ashore either dead or dying along the Oregon and southwest Washington coast. The Wildlife Center of North Coast says that almost all of them are starving. According to one volunteer, they're totally emaciated. And biologists say that the fish the birds normally eat are simply not there. Biologist Leslie Slater of the Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge says what we're seeing more precisely is that the birds seem to be dying. There are reports of similar deaths down the Alaska Peninsula and the eastern edge of the Aleutians. And Slater goes on to say that it is possible that the deaths of the birds could be related to the dead whales. Even more bizarre is that other animals are not eating the washed-up carcasses of the birds, and no seals are swimming along the shore or the mouth of the river. Tribal people in the area are asking whether this is potentially related to the Fukushima power plant disaster. That's what we want to know, too. In Oak Ridge, Tennessee, an Energy Department Inspector General's report is critical of the Y-12 National Security Complex's response after small vials of bomb-grade uranium almost left the plant on a laundry truck. And no, Sister Megan Rice had absolutely nothing to do with it. The Inspector General's biggest gripe? There was a delay in notifying the plant shift superintendent that the incident had occurred. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Kids, you want to visit a real hot spot? Not a problem. In Broomfield, Colorado, you can now hike near a nuclear dump site. That's right. The public is now going to be allowed access to the Rocky Flats Wildlife Refuge at the site of the secret nuclear weapons plant once designated the most contaminated site in America. Mm -mm -mm. Now, officials, a.k.a. experts, say Rocky Flats is safe for the public. Carl Sprang of the Colorado Health Department said, the contaminant levels there are below any regulatory concern. That's right. The regulators aren't concerned. They've washed their hands of it and transferred control to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the head of the signed off on it completely. No problems at all with going for long hikes, breathing the dust, examining the potentially mutating species all around you. After all, if an official says it's safe, it must be safe, mustn't it? Now, a spoil sport named Ted Ziegler, who worked at Rocky Flats for more than a decade, brought up some pesky concerns at a recent meeting of government reps. He said, plutonium or any other toxic or hazardous material is still on the plant site. It's just buried. But if you want to go hiking near the nuke site, 
don't listen to a spoiled sport who actually worked on the site and actually knows what's there and is honestly concerned about it. Listen to the health department who's dumping this hot potato and saying wildlife workers, wildlife visitors should have no concern about visiting and enjoying the wildlife there in the refuge. And that's why, Colorado Health Department, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. And in South Korea, a coalition of 11 civic groups have been protesting the construction of nuclear reactors in Yongduk and are calling for a popular vote on the issue in front of the county council. The vote won't be legally binding, but locals argue that the government has frozen them out of the decision-making process. Sounds a lot like us over here. We'll have the week's featured interview in just a moment, but first, good news on the Nuclear Hot Seat website fix. The tech support team reports that it is expected to be 70% restored, that's 70% restored, by the end of this week. I'm pushing to get that much up and accessible to you as we keep backfilling the earlier episodes. For those of you who have donated to the Nuclear Hot Seat website Fix Fund, I am tremendously grateful, because without you, we could never have gotten this massive project even started. Some very generous listeners sent donations in the past week, and we are now less than $200 away from raising the full amount necessary to pay for the website reconstruction, as well as an improved, more functional site, and nuclear containment vessel strength protection for that website with its four-year archive of interviews. We still have a temporary landing page up at NuclearHotSeat.com where you can access download links to the past several weeks of the show. That's where you'll also find a secure link to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit card or debit card. As I said, we are almost at our goal to pay for this website fix but your donation is still needed to help get us over the top. So let's squeak this one through in the next week, okay? If you have ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, please do it now. Any amount is appreciated and no amount is insignificant. Every donation, no matter what the size, is a sign to me that you care about this show, and that alone helps keep it and me going. Please, don't wait. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com to find the secure donate link. If you prefer not to donate online, email me for a snail mail address to send your donation. You can do that at info at NuclearHotSeat.com. You can even make your donation anonymous if you prefer, as one donor who prints very neatly managed to do last week. Know that I am deeply touched not only by the generosity of you, the listeners, but some of the notes I've received as well are really very deeply touching and motivating and nourishing to my soul. So whatever you can do to help, you have my thanks and my gratitude. Mary Beth Brangan, along with her husband, Jim Heddle, are the indomitable energies behind the Ecological Options Network, or Eon3.net. For more than 30 years, they've been involved with not only organizing anti-nuclear events, but filming and making documentaries about our movement. Mary Beth, along with many others, organized an event in western Marin County, just north of San Francisco, that took place on September 2nd. It was entitled... Fukushima Contamination in the Ocean and in the Biosphere, and it featured a knockout panel with two scientists who are deeply involved in radiation issues, Timothy Mousseau and Ken Bissler. Here's Mary Beth's view of the event, what was said by each of these gentlemen, the issues covered, her own observations, and what we can do to move this movement forward. Mary Beth Brangan, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks, Libby. Great to be here. You were recently involved with a public event that took place on Fukushima contamination in the ocean and the biosphere. What was your involvement with that, and how was that pulled together? Our good friend, Bing Gong, from Point Reyes, 
organized this event. He was the main organizer, and it was co-sponsored by Fukushima Response Campaign out of Sonoma County, and also Point Ray's Books and ourselves, Zeon Ecological Options Network. And I was in conversation with the two scientists, Ken Bissler from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and Tim Mousseau, who's from the University of South Carolina. And it was really an interesting evening. Our community really appreciated it because we're right along the coast in West Marin. We're right along the Northern California Pacific Coast. And we all love this land and ocean. And we love our seafood, too, I might add. So everybody's been very concerned about what's happening with Fukushima contamination. For those people who may not be familiar with either Ken Buesler or Timothy Mousseau, tell us just enough so we can get oriented to what their areas of expertise are. Well, Ken Bissler is a marine radiochemist, and he's the director of the Center for Marine and Environmental Radioactivity out of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts. And Ken, right after Fukushima, he quickly raised over $4 million and went out in a ship to test the waters off of uh, the shore of Fukushima. And he has found incredible amounts of radioactivity from that point. And he was very concerned about the oceans, being an oceanographic scientist and loving the ocean. So he's tried to find further funding after measuring millions and millions of becquerels per meter squared of water immediately after the, the disaster in the ocean. And then he couldn't get anyone from the U.S. government to fund ongoing studies. And uh, the foundation that initially funded him wasn't willing to continue. So he did what's called crowdfunding and had a campaign that asked uh, citizens along the coast to organize and fundraise and then pay for their individual samples to be tested in his lab. It is quite expensive, actually, but that's I guess the cost of doing this kind of science it is $550 per sample. Wow. But, but 52 different locations up and down the coast, all the way down to Mexico and in Hawaii, and uh, one in Guam too, I think, are doing this. And we here in our area have worked out Fortunately, there have been enough people willing to pitch in so that we've had several done, and we hope to have several more done. Are there any results that can be discussed at this time? Yes, actually. Just recently, there have been finally the evidence from Fukushima contamination, which is the cesium-134, along with the cesium-137, which is already in the ocean everywhere because of above ground testing and ocean testing in the 60s, 50s, 60s. The presence of cesium-134 was detected off the coast of Eureka, which is the northernmost point along the California coast uh, it was about 100 miles offshore last year in 2014. So that was the first we'd heard of it. And then in uh, February of this year, 2015, in Euclid, there was a cesium-134 detected. Now that is a coastal village off of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And also in April, in early April, sample was taken off Del Mar, which is all the way down, very close to San Diego, as you know, 
and it measured the highest actually so far in cesium-134 and 137. And then when Ken was here just last week, he mentioned that he believes that the lab had just detected one from Seattle, but I haven't been able to get much detail on that. So right now we're, we're seeing it's finally hitting along the coast from British Columbia all the way down to Del Mar, which is like San Diego. This is the first solid indication that we've had that can be backed up with science. I mean, there's a lot of colloquial information out there, if that isn't a contradiction in terms. But this is the first scientific reading information that shows that the marker, the thumbprint of Fukushima, the radiation in the water from the cesium, has come to our coast or is coming very close. Did Busler, by the way, is it Busler? It's Bissler. It's Bissler. Okay, I've been mispronouncing it all the time. Me too. Did Bissler have any, if not conclusions, at least suppositions, based on the pattern that he's seeing of the radiation showing up? He mentioned that the warm water blob that many people have reported on that's causing such anomalies that's off the coast in the Pacific here, he thinks that that's maybe keeping more of the Fukushima plume from getting close to shore. And also he said that there's such complex currents along the shores that it's hard to model and that's proving very interesting because it's not coming directly onshore, it's still offshore everywhere except Euclid in British Columbia. So we're still waiting to see what happens and how much will actually make it to the shore and how much more might show up at that time. He says that he thinks that it's going to be very diluted and that it might only be as much as the radioactivity that was detected by Scripps Institute when the above ground testing was taking place. The Scripps Institute measured very extensively in 1961 and discovered that it went up to 8 becquerels per meter square then and now it's gone down to about 2 becquerels per meter squared but it's everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So we are now adding, according to Ken, at one point he said it'll be about the same level as was found after the above ground testing. And those levels were like eight becquerels per meter square, which, by the way, is a ton of water. A meter square is a ton of water. So that's easier to picture, I think. And then another time he said it's only about values of two becquerels per meter squared, which I don't get, you know, the... Yeah. yeah, you see, this is an area that I find so confusing because numbers are mentioned, measurements are taken, but it never seems to be put into a context where I understand, so, okay, if I go in the ocean and swim around in this stuff or I get hit by a wave and maybe swallow some of it, is there a risk? To what extent is there a risk? And actually, there's got to be some risk because it's there. Something is there in the water. Well, Ken puts it this way. He says that you could swim six straight years in water that has two becquerels per meter squared, and it would take you that long to get as much of a dose of radioactivity as one dental x-ray. I hate now, the x-ray comparison. Hate it, hate it, hate it, because an x-ray lasts a, a fraction of a second, goes through you, and it's gone. There's no differentiation 
between internal and external doses of radiation, the duration of exposure, is it in the morning marine layer? How constantly are we being hit with possibly radioactive water? It's more constant than a frickin' x-ray. Ken did acknowledge that that is much worse to ingest it, but that was his comparison to external, which is the gamma. If you got the internal, then you would be getting beta and gamma. And that's what we need to know. We need to have a number. It's never good to ingest gamma and beta radiation. <laughs> <laughs> I took it off my menu a while ago, thank you. I gave it up with gluten. <laughs> What we really need to know is what the rate of biomagnification is and bioconcentration. Um, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, the definition of bioconcentration is when you absorb this radioactivity from, in this case, it would be through the water, through your skin. And then biomagnification would be once the phytoplankton has absorbed the radioactivity, it concentrates it in its body because it eats a lot of it. And then krill eat the phytoplankton, be, concentrate that in their body, and then the small fish would eat the krill and concentrate it in their bodies. And then the larger fish would eat smaller fish and then that would be further concentrated and biomagnified up along the chain of predators till you get to what's called the apex predator which are whales and humans and we need to know the rate of biomagnification now in 1955 there was a naval study done on biomagnification spurred by the testing and the Japanese anger about the testing in the Marshall Islands which is one of the spawning grounds that they use in their diet in Japan they were furious with the testing that the U.S. was doing in their food supply. So they asked to have the study done. And Bob Alvarez released it when he was working for John Glenn. Well, we have the cover of that 1955 study, and we have a one-paragraph extract from it that says it can be biomagnified by thousands of times the amount that's found in water. We don't know, though, whether that means by the time it's in the apex predator or whether that's the krill stage that it's magnified thousands of times, and we need to know that. And there is a study investigating that sort of relationship. There is a scientist who wants to study the ecosystems in the ocean. He's out of British Columbia as well as Simon Fraser University. And he's working to understand how long it's going to be before it would pose a danger to whales and to humans to eat the fish based on the numbers that they're getting from this Fukushima radiation concentrations that they're finding now. But I think that Ken expects these concentrations to increase. So we'll have to watch both the increase in the water and then figure out the biomagnification rates to really understand what's going on. Ken Bissler has sometimes been seen as, to be generous, conservative in his evaluation of risk in the water to the point where for many people he's controversial. What was your take based on the presentation that he gave and your experience of the man? Well, I came away from it understanding his point of view a little bit better. But again, what he says is, I don't expect to see it in the fish if I'm not seeing it in the water. And he's saying that these readings aren't that much. That's what he really thinks. But A, we don't know whether the concentrations are going to continue to increase. And B, he doesn't know the rate of biomagnification. So 
I do think that Ken's dismissing of the potential for problems here is a little premature, for sure. That, that's my opinion. Especially because now we've got the work of Dr. Mousseau, Tim Mousseau, who's been studying the effects in Chernobyl. Tell us a bit about his work and what he brought to the table that night. He's an evolutionary biologist, first of all, which is very interesting, with a special interest in looking at maternal adaptations. He and a colleague from Denmark decided to go to Chernobyl some years ago and start looking at how the radioactivity there has affected the plant life and the birds and bunnies, as he says. So he and uh, his partner have amassed a huge amount of very interesting data that when you put it together with Dr. Van Dachevsky's work on humans, really does suggest a very gaunt picture of what's happening because of the radioactivity. And nobody else was doing this. Nobody else was bothering. Of course, there was the Yablokov book with those thousands of studies of humans, but no one was really doing a very independent look on the flora and the fauna. So I really appreciate Tim's work. And what he was finding is he was studying butterflies and other animals, the insects, because they generate and they have generations so rapidly. Am I remembering this correctly? He did birds and small rodents and also plants and trees. And then they were looking at spiders and they did look at butterflies and moths. And what were the specific findings that they were coming up with? What they saw was a decrease in population. Some populations were more sensitive than others. Some individuals within a population were more sensitive to others. Uh, they saw a dramatic reduction in the biodiversity and a dramatic reduction in fertility. The reason that some species have continued in that area at all is because of what they call immigrants coming in from uncontaminated areas. And also, it turns out, just like with Fukushima, it's very patchy. You can have a very hot spot right next to a, a place that's, that's really relatively clean. Even there in Chernobyl, it's so interesting how the fallout is erratic like that. You mentioned in passing the work of Professor Yuri Bondashevsky. Now, he was director of the Gomel Medical Institute in Belarus after Chernobyl. What were his findings that you learned about, and what happened to him as a result of his research? Dr. Bandachevsky, who's my hero, I'll tell you, was taking samples of the tissue from children's cadavers. A lot of the children died very young, you know, and Belarus probably got the most concentrated of the fallout from Chernobyl. So what he was finding was that very low amounts of cesium started the disease process in these children. And what he realized was that was because they were already weakened in their genetic resilience because of the 1960s testing of nuclear bombs in Russia that had affected their parents because then this was in the 80s. So it was a generational mutations that had been passed on to the children, and then the children couldn't cope. Their body's regulatory systems were already destabilized, and so they were sensitized to the radiation. And low amount of cesium between 11 and 30 becquerels per kilogram was enough to start the disease process in their hearts, 
And there's something called Chernobyl Heart that's happening now, as well as the Chernobyl Necklace, which was referred to the thyroid epidemic of cancer that somebody had their thyroids operated on that they have this scar that they call the Chernobyl Necklace. And also, Dr. Bandichevsky found a lot of heart disease, and this has become known as Chernobyl Heart. Activists out of Ireland are paying for the children, many of the children there, to have heart surgery to help them survive. It's so common. So what he found was because of this already weakened condition, they were affected by really low amounts of, of cesium, which they were ingesting through the contaminated food. And so between 11 and 30 started the disease, uh, heart problems, and then by 50 becquerels per kilogram of concentration in their bodies, the tissue damage was permanent. So it was really shocking and heartbreaking to see that. And then when you think about what Tim Mousseau and his partner are finding in Chernobyl, which is that those species pass down the mutations through the generations and it increases, damage increases, and the only way that they're continuing, he thinks, is they're actually achieving a balance, the ones that are able to survive there at all, by the influx of uncontaminated members of the same species from outside the area who are coming in and mating with the already contaminated ones. So it's kind of a balance, but it's much reduced in population. Again, there are some populations that didn't survive at all. And uh, also, I didn't mention this earlier, the soil microbes have been affected because they all of a sudden realized, hey, these trees are not decomposing at the rate that one would think that they would be decomposing. And so they studied the organisms that do break things down in a forest and found that they were incredibly diminished. And so Tim is now also going to Fukushima and studying the flora and fauna there and also the soil microbes. I can't wait to hear what he finds this trip. He left the day after our program to go to Tokyo. He had put out, I forget how many, bags of plant material to see what happened with the microbes there in Fukushima. Of course, I wonder what, after the typhoon, what that will do to the microbes and whether they could capture that or not. He seems to be finding comparable results in his studies in Fukushima that he found in Chernobyl, which is the mutations are being passed down through generations and some species are becoming sensitized. And he's also finding things like white patches in birds and cows that are not normal that seems to be a result of exposure to radioactivity. That was one of the things I learned after Three Mile Island, that one of the side effects of being exposed to radiation was that hair would gray out very quickly. It would create the white patches. And I grayed out early. I don't know if it's a family thing or what, but with the white patches, I've seen the pictures of the cows with the speckles on them and the birds as well. What I'm hearing is that we have a history now, thanks to Professor Bandyshevsky, who I believe ended up being tortured in prison in Russia for his findings. In Belarus, actually, because they didn't want this information out. They wanted to have people continue living on the land, and that's exactly what they're doing in Japan. They don't want the information to come out because they want the land to continue to be used, as contaminated as it is. 
that would be comparable or one could extrapolate out to the United States where right now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is simultaneously stopping a study that it was doing on the effect of radiation from nuclear reactors on children and also at the same time considering this ridiculous set of petitions to change the basis of understanding radiation exposure from the scientifically proven gold standard of linear no threshold to the unproven false put science in quotes theory of hormesis which says eh, a little bit of radiation is good for you so it's almost like the governments are trying to assure us that nothing is wrong, whereas the scientists, starting with Bandyshevsky, working up through the work of Mousseau, and even with Ken Bissler saying, okay, it's not so bad now, that doesn't mean it's not going to get worse and this isn't all going to add up. It sounds like what we're looking at here is the continual and inevitable impact of radiation on all of us. That's what we're so concerned about, isn't it, Weeby? And actually, Ken, even though he is controversial with the people who are very concerned about this, he is providing numbers that nobody else is, and so we really appreciate that. He would like to have a lot more testing going on, but it's expensive to do. He's trying to figure out different ways to do it, so he has more numbers to work with. Tim is attacked by the pro-nuclear people, and Ken by the anti-nuclear people, so I, I <laughs> joked at our, at our event that we had a balanced program. <laughs> well, if you put them together, you shake them up, and then you divide them in half, it's all equal. So, based on this, it sounds like it was an incredible event that took place, very informative, and not one that I've heard duplicated elsewhere in the country. What came out of that, if anything, as to a course of action that we need to be taking in order to follow up on this information and stay on course with the monitoring and tracking and all the rest? What can we do to be of support? We all need to help fund independent science, unfortunately. It's not going to come from our government. It's obvious. I mean, they're going in exactly the opposite direction, which is to legalize and uh, normalize ever-increasing amounts of radioactivity and to pretend like it's good for us, as you pointed out. So I think that's A number one. We've got to get behind these scientists that are doing work and make donations. Lucas Hickson is going to start and others are going to be showing up, I'm sure, I hope, and uh, we just need to really make sure we're behind them and watch what their findings are. And the second thing is I think we need to really support the people in Japan, my goodness, who are being forced to go back into contaminated land. It just breaks my heart. I mean, and the women with their children and how, oh, it's just... And the Japanese people themselves are out in the streets trying to object to the militarism and to the restarting of their reactors. And we've got to support them and spread the word that this is not all right. We have to support those efforts by the Japanese people somehow. Also, we've got to shut down our own potential Fukushimas here. Diablo Canyon. In California is sitting in between 13 intersecting earthquake faults, four of the major, major, and it's getting old, it's embrittled, they've been having problems of all kinds, and it's also in a tsunami zone right there on the central coast of California. And we need also to keep an eye on and pressure that the people in charge of dealing with the radioactive waste in San Onofre, which is in San Clemente, also right on the beach and in a tsunami zone, needs to be properly 
managed and responsibly uh, managed. It needs to be in containers that are going to be able to withstand the corrosive elements for at least the time that it's going to take to move it if it ever does get moved. If ever there was a place that should have the radioactive waste moved, it is San Onofre. However, that is a big unknown. We, there's no currently there's no way to do that and nowhere to put it. So all this technology has to be developed, and we can't let them get away with just putting it in underground, which is what they want to do. Underground at beach level is underwater. I mean, come on. It, it's crazy. And so all of these issues need to be dealt with here in California as they do across the country and across the world. We've got to prevent more Fukushima's from happening. And as I mentioned in my presentation the night of the event, there's a study that's just come out this year that shows that there's a 50% chance of another Fukushima happening within the next 50 years. And another Three Mile Island could happen in the next 10 years, according to the statistics. So we really can't afford to let the government be so irresponsible. As happens sometimes, after I finished the interview with Mary Beth, she realized there was a piece of information she wanted to make certain that we had, and she called me back and we recorded this next piece. Ken Beesler has said that he's now more concerned about strontium-90 contamination than he is about cesium. TEPCO has admitted to measuring huge spikes in strontium-90 from the outflow from Fukushima, and as we know, we never know whether to trust their numbers or not, but they've said it was like 1 million becquerels per meter cubed. Cesium acts like potassium, and, and it can be excreted like a salt from the body of both fish and humans. But strontium-90, this is why Ken Bissler is more concerned, it lodges in the bones and teeth. And it's also more difficult to measure than cesium. However, Vital Choice, a company that sells canned and frozen seafood and fish oil supplements, has the integrity to test for radioactivity and report its findings to the public, has, in its fifth round of testing, found one sockeye salmon that contained no cesium, but a whopping 65 becquerels per kilogram of strontium-90. So Ken's concerns are well-founded. Mary Breth Brangan of EM3.net. There was even more information that Mary Beth shared that we didn't have time for on today's show, but will show up in the coming weeks on Nuclear Hot Seat. Now you can find EM3's enormous archive of videos on YouTube, and you can find either her or her husband behind a camera at virtually any major anti nuclear event that you can get to. If they can get there, they're going to be behind a camera. The video of the event featured this week on the show, Fukushima contamination in the ocean and in the biosphere, will be up very soon on YouTube on the Eon 3 channel. Do subscribe. Activist shout out. Lucas Hickson, reporter extraordinaire at informable.com, has just returned from what's being labeled a 10-day excursion to Ukraine to visit the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. I usually think of excursions as being a little less stressful than that, but be that as it may, after spending a week on site touring the plant, Lucas has returned to the U.S. with an overwhelming amount of data and media that he will be sharing through Informable.com in the coming weeks. He describes this trip as one of the most appreciated activities he has undertaken in recent years. And quite frankly, I can't wait to hear his take on what's going on there. Lucas, you've got guts. Here's today's final thought. You know, I'm just back from my own excursion, and it was far less stressful than Chernobyl. I spent five days camping in a national forest, unplugged, off-grid, dispersed campground completely away from the modern world and any of the human beings in it. 
I think I saw maybe ten vehicles in that entire time, and there were long stretches of hours upon hours where I heard not a single sound generated by a human being or human technology. I loved every moment of the isolation. It's good to get away, and this was the very definition of away. It's good to not be confronted by all the awfulness of the world, at least for a little while. It was especially comforting not to think about nuclear matters. Oh, a stray thought would cross my mind occasionally, and I just let it keep straying and moving along and go right out my brain. You know, it's easy to get tied up in all the awful news, the frustrations, the fears that we live with working within this movement and knowing exactly how bad things can be and probably already are. In recent weeks, I found myself getting snappish on Facebook with people who I consider to be my friends and with perfect strangers. Not cool. And if I haven't apologized to you before now, know that I am truly sorry for my behavior. Stress sucks the goodness out of a person. So I went to the woods to remember who I am and refill the parts of me that truly matter. I knew that all this would be waiting for me upon my return. Let's face it, if plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years, me taking five days off from my computer in this movement in the rest of the 21st century won't change a thing. And it didn't. All that yucky stuff is still here. Same old story. Same problems. The only thing that's changed is me. At least I'm rested enough to take it on again. So if you are feeling stressed out, angry, depressed, exhausted, and want to take a bite out of your Facebook algorithm because the world is so insane, give yourself a break. Take some time off and reclaim the parts of your humanity that are being choked out. Be gentle with yourself and then share that gentleness and the peace that comes from it with others. It's the only way you, it's the only way we, all of us, We'll be able to keep going until we win. And we will. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 15, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, TEPCO, Japan Times, fukuweeks.org, simplyinfo.org, newyorktimes.com, ibtimes.co.uk, asahi.com, rt.com, nhk, fukushima diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki. Beyond Nuclear, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Radiation and Public Health Project, Erica Gray, wamc.org, snl.com, timesfreepress.com, Mining Awareness Plus, the Denver Channel.com, KGW, KBBI, English.hani.co.kr, the poor pitiful word pushers at World Nuclear News, and the Zen-like masters of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.tv, and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, or it will be shortly, I hope, trust, fingers crossed. It's also available on iTunes, and our YouTube channel carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, thanks to Joni Ray, who gets her assistance from Ms. Milky the Clown. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libiha Levy and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libiha Levy of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all, yes, all of us, each and every one of us, in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat.
the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear hot.